Oh, man. All righty, guys. What is up? What is up? Um, be, I'll, I'll, I'll be fully transparent on the show throughout the night. We're going to probably try to put up tonight like three or four videos. Been a little bit busy. Like life happens, right? You kind of have a, a day job. And I, I love doing these, um, these YouTube podcasts. I love the sport of college football. If you want to talk to me about NBA basketball or NFL football, like I'll, I'll also engage in, in sports and um, just been busy. You know, it's a, uh, it's a fun time of year, though. Um, just uh, I got to. So, so usually I do a couple of videos a week. Um, and guys, I just got to say, like this time of year. It's just insane in college football. Um, I'm going to be literally doing a transfer portal video, and people shouldn't feel bad for me. This is kind of like a hobby at this stage. But we're going to be doing a transfer portal video today on the quarterbacks. We got the college football playoff, uh, which, which which is what this video will be about, is the college football playoff. Fascinating scenarios in the 14 playoff. We're going to talk about every scenario right now. And then we got just so much coaching news. Like, I need to talk about Petrino tonight. I need to talk about Sean Lewis going to San Diego State. Fran Brown, what an opportunity for him. Fran Brown um, going to be going to Syracuse. Very interesting hire. We covered uh, the big ones earlier. Uh, e- even bigger jobs like, you know, Michigan State, A&M, um, Seth Luttrell. So, so that's just kind of a brief introduction. But now we're going to get on with the show. So on Friday night, we have the Pac-12 championship. And I would say that ever since two years ago, like, I just love the story of Dan Lanning. I love how he, you know, I mean, I could go on and on, but like how he went, you know, middle of the night, was like a high school coach in in Kansas City, um, played D3 or D2 football at uh, William Jewell. Then he went to Pittsburgh, right, through the Nitro, 14 hours to get his to get his start as a GA at Pittsburgh. He's an ultimate grinder. You know, then went to Arizona State, came from came from nothing really in terms of football. Didn't know anybody. And just an incredible story. Now he's one of the best coaches in all of college football. This Oregon thing, Oregon's just been incredible. I mean, what they did with Bo Nix, Bo Nix was a failing SEC quarterback, a guy that at Auburn was expected to lift the world on his shoulders, who came in as a five-star out of Pinson, Alabama. His dad played quarterback at Auburn. All the pressure in the world to be the savior of Auburn football, to save Gus Malzahn's job. And he had a couple of really nice moments, a couple of really nice games, but he could never fully put it together. It looked like at times at Auburn, he didn't know how to handle Brit Blitz pressure. He would fade. He looked like he was a 5'10", 5'11", quarterback out there. He, he looked incredibly skittish, would make incredibly poor decisions. He was inconsistent and downright bad at at a lot of times as Auburn as an underclassman. But guess what? That's kind of, wow, had to open up the water there. Uh, That's apparently par for the course at Auburn. Or for an underclassman. I didn't even mean at Auburn. So he then goes to Oregon. They hire Kenny Dillingham, like Lanning ends up hiring Kenny Dillingham and Kenny Dillingham. I mean, he was literally not even calling the plays at Florida State. It was Mike Norvell. Kenny Dillingham's like never called plays. It was literally Mike Norvell calling the plays his whole time at Memphis. And then Kenny Dillingham, it was like at um at Auburn, like Gus Malzahn pretty much treated Dillingham. Dillingham would never say this, but I really believe it. It was Gus's show, and Kenny Dillingham was kind of the uh, QB coach and go get you know coffee for Gus Malzahn. It's funny how life works now. So Kenny Dillingham now kind of on top of the world himself, but what a hire by Dan Lanning with Kenny Dillingham. Junior Adams, who coached Cooper Cup. I mean, this staff, it's as meticulous of a program as there is anywhere in college football. I mean, Oregon has never played with this SEC-like intensity. There's never... So, so, so guys, the, the Oregon Ducks story is an amazing story. And then this year, they went up to Washington. It was the loudest game by, by people who said they went there. They said it was one of the loudest games in the history of this 
rivalry or in the history of maybe, you know, college football, maybe in the past 15 years. And it was a da- it was a downright classic. It's not like or- uh, Oregon played poorly. I mean, Troy Franklin played great. Bo Nix made several plays. Michael Penix, man, he has an NFL arm. He has an elite arm at any level of football. He would even, if you put him in a combine with NFL quarterbacks, Kenny Pickett, Desmond Ritter, he's even he's even better, more impressive than some of the bottom tier NFL quarterbacks. He he could be a starter in the NFL. The guy came from Indiana, had all the talent, was a three star out of Tampa. You know, kind of had the physical traits, but fell through the cracks of recruiting. And then Ryan Grubb, DeBoer, they get him in Washington, and and that thing is a juggernaut. So I have immense respect for Washington, and in fact, I mean, I don't really, I, I prefer Oregon. So if you like Oregon, you're not going to like Washington that much. You can respect the rival, but really be damn frustrated every time those two play. Um, and dislike the other team, not want them to win, but you could really respect their players and their scheme. But guys, like, Oregon is a huge favorite in this game, huge. And I know Washington State, like, escaped um, certain teams. Like, I guess Utah was close. Arizona State, they really played poorly. Stanford on the farm, they didn't bring their own juice to that game necessarily. But guess what? Auburn or Washington has talented players defensively. This game could be a dogfight. Even Oregon State was able to to throw on Oregon um, a little bit like Dante Manning came into the game at, at cornerback but really it's going to be about Bucky it's going to be about Jordan James we'll see if Gary Bryant's healthy T Ferg like Oregon's Oregon's like offense is like an and it's like it's like there's a bunch of guys that just play like professionals and Will Stein out of UTSA I mean how did Lannon come up with that hire that's insane he got a co-offensive coordinator from Conference USA to be his offensive coordinator like, he didn't just go for the big name, no. And guess what? Now Will Stein's up for the um, the Broyles Award, or he's up for the Assistant Coach of the Year Award. And and a lot can actually be attributed to the quarterback who plays the most in college football, Bo Nix. So that's an Oregon segment. I think it's going to be a great, great championship game. Great game. I think Oregon has a great chance to pull it out. But I'm so impressed by the margin of victory of the Oregon Ducks. I'm so impressed that they hammer every team. Like, there's no Washington. Like, when Washington played Arizona State, they looked terrible. There's really no games on the schedule. Oregon's played like a flawless, flawless year. I would say that Georgia, the Georgia Bulldogs, they've played a flawless, flawless year. I guess you can nitpick Georgia Tech. They didn't play their best, but guess what? Against Tennessee and Ole Miss, they hammered, hammered those teams. Ole Miss is a dang, is a, is a pretty good football team. Carson Beck's played an amazing season of football. Georgia's a very worthy playoff team. The Michigan Wolverines. They're undefeated. They're going to probably beat Iowa. You could say what you want about Harbaugh, and and it, it it's tough. I mean, the thing is about Harbaugh, right? Like, is going to games and paying people to literally stay on someone's sideline, or like even going to the you know even like getting onto the Central Michigan sideline, like that stuff seems totally like it does seem over the top. It doesn't offend me that much. Offends me a little bit. It does offend me a little bit because if you know a pass or a run is coming, and there's still going to be more about that, right? Everyone steals, st- uh, everyone steals signs. Everyone shares film. That's college football. That's that's actually sports. If you're involved in sports, like you try to get your opponents, you know, plays. Or you try to listen in to what they're coaching. Like, if you ever coach any sport, you're going to try to, you know, look at signs and tendencies of your opponent. That's life, and that's really sports. Michigan might have won. They did go over the top in that regard. But they're a great football team. They, this year has been a pleasure in terms of watching them run the football, in terms of what Sharon Moore did. J.J. McCarthy makes timely throws. They are a lock. They're the easiest team to put into the Final Four. If Auburn just beat Alabama, if Auburn could have just guarded 4th and, fir- and 35, Alabama's a good team this year. I'm not sure they're one of the four best, but we're going to find out against Georgia. But if Auburn would have beaten them, this would have been an easier scenario to pick the best for. So I believe that Georgia and Michigan, Michigan's definitely in. Um, Alabama, boy, oh boy. Alabama, they, they can throw a wrench into this thing if they end up beating the Georgia Bulldogs. But Georgia, 
better quarterback play. Jalen Milrow is a really good player. He's a really good quarterback. Um, he could throw the heck out of the football, even as a stronger arm, better deep ball than even Carson Beck. But intermediate-wise, it still at times can be shaky, and it looks shaky against Auburn. So really, really interesting, interesting, you know, kind of uh, kind of game that you have in the SEC championship. And then we'll talk about Florida State. So Florida State plays in the ACC, so they already kind of have, they already play in, a, in the weakest Power 5 league. At times, the ACC can look at, like, group of five, the bottom of that league can just be downright really poor. But they did go to Clemson and win, and damn, that's impressive. Clemson still has great talent on their defensive front. Their defense, Clemson, is legit. That's a great, great win in overtime. That was a battle. The way they beat LSU... The way that Keon Coleman and Johnny Wilson and Jaheim Bell, like that, that's like the best skill group in the country. And Jordan Travis was a top five quarterback. Malik Benson or Trey Benson, I believe, they had with, with Jordan Travis an incredible offense, really have good coaching. And also the defensive ends like Jared Verse, they have NFL guys on their defense. So they were like a pretty dang, like pretty complete team. They played in a bad league. They weren't the most consistent team. They could have lost at Boston College. Miami was a damn close game. But now they don't have their quarterback, and it's a shame because they're not going to get that, that tested by a Louisville. Like, could you imagine if, like, let me put an example of, of a team. How great would it be if, like, they had to beat LSU to go to the to go into the playoff? How great would it be if they had to beat a Texas, like if Texas and them would square off, or an Oklahoma with Rodemaker? Because if they were with Rodemaker, even against Miami and even against those teams, you'd get a much better perspective on you know, the, the, how great of a team they can be with their backup quarterback. You don't want to punish them for injury. Like that's very tough. They've played in the ACC. They didn't blow out everybody. That's why I maybe think the criteria, like to me, I'm more impressed by a team like Georgia and Oregon and Michigan where they hammer opponents every single week and show that consistency. Like when you win by three or seven, when you barely escape, like, yeah, it's kind of nice. In the fact of Washington, if they beat, the good news is Washington can put the whole we win narrowly to the test. And if they beat Oregon, like they beat Oregon State, that was a tremendous, tremendous win. It's a better win than Florida State's had in a very, very long time. So the great news about the Huskies is they play in a good enough league. They play in a good league that they're going to get to test their theory out. It's essentially a playoff game, I believe, out in the desert. At least I want it to happen. I want the Pac-12 in. I want probably Georgia and Michigan in. So that's probably the three, okay? But Alabama can throw a wrench into it. Then we have Texas. We then have Texas. We would then have Texas and Florida State as the last as the last team. And, and it would make it all easier. This would be actually the scenario, believe it or not, since I really like Oregon and want to see them compete for a championship against the best, this is how I'd like to see it shake out. This is the, and, and the committee would like to see this shake out as well. They would love it. There could be a scenario where Louisville, be, Louisville actually wins the ACC championship. And if you were going to say before the year that Jeff Brom in year one at Louisville with Plumber there, is going to win the ACC championship. That is incredible. So Louisville, I got to give them credit. Like, they beat Duke. I think they beat Notre Dame this year. Jeff Brom up for maybe one of the coaching of the year awards. Tremendous. If you could put that in your arsenal, Louisville, that you're a conference champion in the ACC, even if without Jordan Travis starting a Florida State, like, that's still a great accomplishment for your school. That is big time, big time, big time, big time stuff. So Louisville will be motivated. They just lost to Kentucky. If Louisville wins... Georgia wins, Oregon and Michigan, and Texas, that means that we will get, I'll, I'll probably do the rankings. So Georgia and Michigan, that would mean that Georgia most likely, I think Georgia's probably still won. I think Georgia would be number one in this scenario. I think Michigan would play Oregon, and I think we'd have Georgia, Texas, and Michigan, Oregon. 
And trust me, I think that the committee, they want to see an Oregon team at three play against Michigan. That would be a perfect playoff. Texas gets in at four with Quinn Ewers, and then it's Texas and that offense against Georgia, and it's Oregon versus Michigan as the 3-2. This would be perfect. So guys, for this to happen, need Georgia to win and need Louisville to win. That's all you need. And then you would need Oregon to win. You would need Oregon to win. And then you would need Texas to win. Ohio State's only chance, now this is going way far out, Louisville, Oklahoma State, Georgia, That they're going to need Oklahoma State. To, so it's fun. It's fun. Like I would say that, and also like now we're expanding the 12. If this were a 16 playoff, we would get the five conference champs in and then you'd get a wild card in. So then you could literally just add Alabama to the, to the list. You could just add Alabama. Or I'm saying like, you'd if you had six, if you had if you had the five spots, then you'd have to put Louisville in. Which, ugh. if you had six spots in the playoff, you could easily fill out the six. The six could actually be perfect. We used to only have two guys, so it, it would just be Georgia, Michigan in the in the championship. And that's the thing: if you get left out. If you're Texas and you have to go play, what, in the Rose Bowl or the Peach Bowl, you'd hope that they, you know, then you got to handle your business and be excited for it. The Rose Bowl would be a great venue for, like, the teams that just missed the playoff. I mean, still, that's where in college football, like, winning a huge bowl game, like, and having a great year and being a conference champ, like, that's where it's it's still, it should still feel pretty good to win a huge championship like that. So, Alabama's a good team. Ohio State, I'm not sure that they're in the four, though. Um, Texas beat Alabama head-to-head. It would give the committee rest if Georgia won. Um, if Louisville eliminated Florida State without Jordan Travis, it would clear up a lot. And then you'd have Pac-12 champ, Michigan, Georgia, and Texas. And that's where I think I would be at the most peace. I would enjoy that the most. Then you'd have Georgia, Texas, little rematch there from a couple of years ago. And then you'd probably have, I'm trying to think of where you'd go prime time, probably Michigan, Oregon prime time, maybe like in the, uh, in the Fiesta Bowl. And in that scenario, it could be, could be Oregon, Georgia again in the final, like a rematch of the game two years ago in Atlanta. Could Dan Lanning beat Kirby? Um, I would love to see Bo Nix, like, honestly, win a champion. I'd love to see him sweep, win the Heisman, win the championship. I mean, what a story from Auburn where he was, you know, public enemy to even the Auburn fans and even the Oregon fans. Like, they weren't, like, enthused. About, they were they were kind of happy about Bo Nix, but Bo Nix at the time, like, he had to battle Ty Thompson for that job and gain their trust, and he's done an incredible job of that. Who could have ever thought he'd be, like, this dominant? That's for a defensive coach and Dan Lanning. It's just brilliant, you know. Drew Maringer, uh, all the guys up there. Um, Marshall Malkow's the mastermind behind the Jimbo Fisher recruiting class. Like it's an elite organization. Georgia's an elite organization. Michigan's elite, and Texas with Sark has they've they deserve the fourth spot because for them to go eleven and one, they lost a game just to Oklahoma. But their D line is salty. They got great wide receivers. They got when Ewers is healthy, he could be one of the top five quarterbacks in the sport, maybe top six. He still has room to grow as well. Um, let's see all what happens, guys. What a fun, fun time this is.